Baseball is back, and there really is nothing like a home team advantage. That's why Team Toyota makes an obvious choice for your next vehicle purchase or service. With their MVP pricing guarantee, teammates reward program, and streamlined customer experience, their award-winning sales and service departments are there for all of your vehicle needs. A home team advantage is nothing without family and community. Their employees are part of the family, they're part of your town, and we're all part of the team. Visit TeamToyota.net and choose one of their three locations in Langhorne, Glen Mills, or Princeton. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the Phillies Talk Podcast presented by Team Toyota. I'm Corey Seidman, joined by our producer Spencer McKercher and Sean Kane, the producer of Phillies Pre and Post Game Live. And we're coming at you on the night of the trade deadline. If you're listening to this, it might be the morning after, but the Phillies made a couple of deals right leading up to the deadline, like the few minutes before. They acquired Tanner Banks, the left-handed pitcher from the White Sox, a reliever, and they sent out Gregory Soto, left-handed reliever, to the Orioles. So... The totality of the deadline for the Phillies is bringing in Carlos Estevez, Tanner Banks, and Austin Hayes. So I'll open it up with you guys, whoever wants to go first. Do you think the Phillies did enough here at the deadline, A, given where they are, you know, the the way the last few weeks have gone, and B, just with, like, the holes or uh, weak spots on the roster? Go, Gaynor. I mean, yeah, yeah. I I do. I I think overall it was good work. I know, like, maybe a lot of people expected some flashier names, but, um, you know, I I think we saw it on, um, you know, Austin Hayes starting to contribute a little more. He got off to a bit of a slow start, but, you know, Tuesday night he hits the big three-run home run, made a nice play in left field. Uh, Estevez, I think, is great. I think he's, you know, as Dave Dombrowski said, he's a guy that they think can help them win the World Series. They paid a pretty hefty price for him, given that he's, uh, you know, a rental and his contract's up, but I like him. Uh, And then the moves right before the deadline, uh, I like it. They basically just replace, you know, Soto with Banks in terms of a a left-handed reliever. Obviously, they didn't trust Soto. He was way too inconsistent and... Uh, which is unfortunate. I was excited, you know, before last season when they traded for him, you know, Veerling and Maton over there for Soto and Clemens. And I was, you know, excited for Soto. I thought he was a guy that was really going to help him. He had his moments, but, you know, just too many blow up appearances, innings, and uh, they, they didn't trust him. And, and, you know, we saw it last year. We saw it again this year. So, yeah, long story short, I like it. I like what they did. I think they're better. Um, you know, not the big splash necessarily, but I think they made some moves that should help them out down the next few months here. Yeah. And Dombo, right, came out and said, he- Talked for a little bit after the trades there during the game. And I mean, he's he's happy with the club. Um, so I guess I, we're taking his word for it and we're moving on. Um, I'm not gonna lie, being in the in the press box today when the Soto news came out, even like post deadline there, it was everyone kind of looked around of like, oh wow, that was kind of shocking to a point. And it sounds like the Orioles kind of wanted him um for the Hayes deal. And you know, Dave and the Phillies said, No, not yet, and mm-hmm. ended up making the the move there, but um, it was good to see Estevez uh, kind of coming in a high situation to a point, you know, down a run there in, uh, in tonight's game on Tuesday night. But, um, yeah, man, uh, I'm kind of shocked that it, it, it kind of stayed light. Um, I guess we're excited for, for good old Seth Johnson to see him in a few years down the road with starting double A. Um, but, yeah, man, with Banks, I don't know. It um, doesn't really have a lot of experience um, in terms of high leverage situations. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what what role he has. I'm sure he'll be in the middle innings. Um, and then maybe we could see him make a start here down the road. So, um, Corey, interested to see what your thoughts were as the, uh, as the deadline came down to it here. Yeah. I mean, it's uncommon to see a team that's in contention trade to relievers who have been mostly high leverage arms for them and Gregory Soto and Sir Anthony Dominguez uh, earlier in the Austin Hayes trade, but it was clearly just a sign that the Phillies didn't trust them in these high leverage spots anymore moving forward. Soto had not reached the level of consistency they wanted over these last two years. Stuff was really good, but he just wasn't able to harness it over sustained periods of time. And I think with the Tanner Banks piece of it, they just look at it like he has four years of control. Gregory Soto was good, about to reach free agency pretty soon. He's getting more expensive. You'd rather pay a guy, you know, one tenth of what Gregory Soto is going to cost if the production is going to be similar and you might get better production out of banks. Uh, the other part of it is that 16 out of his 41 appearances, he's gone more than an inning. So it gives you a guy who can get more than three outs, maybe potentially look to extend him at some point, stretch him back out to starting down the road if you need some depth there. I guess the part of it that I, that I just wonder about, and I think it's something that we'll see in October uh, one way or the other is if enough was done offensively, because the way I look at it is 
you still have one big hole against lefties and you have one big hole against righties. The big hole against lefties is that you're starting either Brandon Marsh or Johan Rojas and Marsh hasn't hit lefties and neither has Rojas. And then against righties, you're probably starting Austin Hayes, who did have a big game on Tuesday night, but he really hasn't hit righties throughout his major league career. So, I mean, I still look at that as potentially having at least one weak spot at the bottom of the lineup. Granted, every team's going to have one weak spot. That Guardians team that just came in here, there were five or six guys that most baseball fans have probably never heard of in that lineup. But, you know, I just, again, I know I've mentioned this a bunch of times, but two of the two of the games in the NLCS last year, Jake Cave made the final out or the second to last out. You don't want that like one of those bit players coming up in a big spot like that. And you might need that based on, you know, the, the uh, additions that were not made offensively, but I mean, what do you guys think? Do you think off in the outfield offensively that that arrangement of Marsh, Rojas, Hayes, Castellanos, is it, is it enough to get the job done? I think it's a lot depends on Marsh. Um, and he started to kind of show some signs, uh, you know, over the weekend into, into Monday, uh, you know, Tuesday goes over six, but, you know, if he can just be, you know, as you mentioned, not not a hole in, in center field, obviously, you know, they're, they're like a little better against uh, right-handed pitching. But if, if he can give him something and not just be as, as bad as he was, you know, in the first three, four weeks of July, or, you know, after he came back from that hamstring injury, um, you know, before that, um, you know, I, I think they could be. Uh, Hayes, you know, remains to be seen. They're high on him, clearly. Um, but no, I hear you. Like, I, I, I'm not confident with the state of this offense right now. And obviously... The, the, at the moment, the bigger concern for me is that the top, you know, the big guys aren't getting the job done. You just have to hope and assume that they'll heat back up. But yeah, there could be some holes there. You know, Rojas offensively is is always going to be an issue. But um, but no, I, I don't I don't feel comfortable like going into the playoffs that I'm not. Oh, we won't see what happened in Game Six and Seven of the NLCS happen again. I think this lineup can go cold. We've seen it recently. Um, so yeah, they're, they're kind of trusting their guys, trusting their stars, as Bryce Harper said to uh, to play like it, and uh, and we'll see. But um, but no, there's some legitimate questions, I think, uh, offensively in the outfield for sure. Yeah. And, and, I, and the, as you just mentioned, Sean, I was going to say that exactly. It's Bryce, you know, after the, the loss the other day, he said, you know, superstars need to step up. And even with the holes in the lineup, yeah, it, it might be a glaring right now. But if, if the superstars hit the way they did, especially in the first half of the season, hopefully we won't have this problem talking about it in October, you know, coming forward. So um, if those guys can step up and do what they normally do and, carry this team and now yeah that is a lot of pressure it's a lot of pressure especially on Bryce right now who's man that that ball tonight um on Tuesday here just in the ninth bases loaded um just missed it I mean fouled it off going the other way done the uh, third baseline I think he's just trying to do too much so I think you know it, it is it is glaring and I'm sure you know hopefully we won't see it come out in October but I don't know man and hopefully Hayes kind of turns into the guy that we all expect him to be um especially towards the end of the season here Celebrity cook Steve Martirano brings his Italian-American cooking back home to Philly. Enjoy Martirano's Prime at Rivers Casino and Steve's famous meatballs with Sunday gravy, prime steaks, and more. Make reservations for Martirano's Prime on Open Table. Well, the other part of it is that like the Phillies are obviously not playing well right now. They've lost five straight series. It's two disappointing losses in a row to the Yankees to begin this uh, exciting you know, series between two of the best teams in baseball and really loud crowds, a lot of visiting fans, and they've had more to cheer for about the Yankees than with the Phillies. So, you know, if you're Dave Dombrowski, Sam Folden company, and you're watching these games unfold, it's hard. I mean, I'd imagine that it's just human nature that when it's unfolding in front of you and the team's in a bit of a rut leading into the deadline, you might want to be more active than not. But these asking prices around the league today were just exorbitant. I mean, Great. based on what the, the Astros traded to get Kikuchi and then what the Padres traded to get Tanner Scott and Brian Hoeing, uh, I mean, we're talking about teams giving up like some of their top prospects uh, for either starting pitchers who haven't been that good or relievers who might not be able to make a huge impact. So I, I got to imagine that played a role in it too, wanting to hold on to the top prospects. Like, you know, a guy who stood out to me that would have been an obvious fit for the Phillies is Randy Arozarena, right handed guy, can play defense, power, speed. But based on what the Mariners trade for him, the Phillies probably would have had to give up one of their top position player prospects. You know, they got two ascending position players. And, like, would you have traded Aiden Miller for a Rosa Rayner straight up? Would you have traded Justin Crawford for him straight up? That's, you know, the, the now versus future conversation. Um, but, yeah, no, what Bryce said is spot on, that it's going to be on those guys. It's going to be on those big money guys. Like we've seen in this Yankee series, Soto and Judge have looked like superstars, right? And the Phillies guys haven't because this probably is, I mean, 
I, I don't maybe that like San Francisco, Colorado portion, but I think back to like the last time the Phillies key guys were cold at the same time. Like right now, Harper, Turner, uh, they went into Tuesday night one for 20, one for 17. Boma driven in one run in his last 20 games. So like yeah. there were portions of the season where everybody's hot at the same time. Then there were portions where there were only a couple guys cold. Now you're just seeing a bunch of guys cold. Plus the bullpen, it seems like there's a little bit of regression there. Like, you know, Matt Strom, pretty surprising to see what we saw out of him on Tuesday night, especially because he's usually spot on with command. Yeah. Yeah. The walks obviously killed him to, uh, to Soto and judge, but yeah, I mean, he, you know, Strom had the, the rough opening day, but then he went what almost two months without giving up an earned run. And he's had a couple slip ups here or there, but yeah, it's concerning. It's concerning. You know, you mentioned Harper and Turner, you know, Schwarber started heating up a little bit. JT to me, hasn't looked like himself. You know, he's still trying to find his timing. Clearly they're going to need him in the middle of the lineup. Um, you know, boom, the RBI production hasn't been there. It's yeah, it's just a start starting to hit a little bit, which is encouraging Had a couple more hits tonight or uh, last night, pardon me, Tuesday night. But, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a lot of guys cold at the same time. The regression in the bullpen is a real thing. Uh, we've seen it a couple times with Alvarado and that's the frustrating thing too, in this stretch here where they've lost 10 to 14 and they've blown a handful of like sizable leads. Like tonight they're up four one. Pittsburgh, they blew a big lead. Nola's last start in Minnesota. You know, Strom came in, had some issues, Kirkering as well. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, if you win those games, all of a sudden this stretch, instead of being four and ten, they're, you know, seven and seven. And it's like, okay, they're treading water. Uh, so yeah, the bullpen's been uh disappointing, uh, you know, in a handful of games that uh that have really come back to hurt them. And hopefully, hopefully Tanner can stop that, right? And I mean, Jose, the the stuff that kind of blew my mind the other night, I guess on Sunday. Um, Jose only left the fourth home run ever he's ever allowed to a lefty before. Um, just kind of stuff like that. It's just, I think, it, you know, it's one of those ebbs and flows that we're going through right now. And hopefully, uh, they can snap out of it. And like I said, you know, I, that's the thing, like Tanner's, you know, Tanner Banks' numbers against the lefties is crazy. Like he's what he faced 83 of them this year and he's struck yeah. out 28 of them. That's a 34% strike rate. Um, according to our good buddy, Jason Stark. So pretty, hopefully, you know, kind of can come in and and battle those lefties too, but we'll see. So despite losing all these games, the Phillies still are pretty much in the same position they were in uh, like a month ago in the NL East standings. The, the only difference is that like the Dodgers are closing in on them, I guess, for uh, the top spot in the National League. There's still a ton of time to go. The Phillies are two games up on the Dodgers. Is there any long-term worry here, any long-term concern about this lingering? Um, you know, there's a challenging part of the schedule coming up here too with – Seattle, which has great starting pitching. You're probably seeing Luis Castillo, George Kirby in that series. Um, then you go to L.A. Dodgers just improved their club at the deadline, and they're getting healthier. And then Arizona, the Diamondbacks are starting to round into form as well. It's a four-game series. I mean, this has the potential. You know, you look at those those games coming up after the Yankees. Uh, you know, I don't think, like, the Mets and Braves are going to be making up ground, but – you could see some slippage here from the Phillies. And I guess this is to be expected. You know, every team, even the best teams, go through this at some point. And this is now the first time these last couple of days the Phillies have been on pace for fewer than 100 wins. They're now on pace for 98. Um, does it change your idea about, like, this team's ceiling? Does it change your idea about what this team's going to be capable of doing in, in 2024? We've been talking on the pre- and post-game shows but right out of the break, actually, to start that Pirate series that, as you just alluded to, started a stretch, that Pirate series of 22 straight games against opponents that are 500 or better. Um, and through the first 12 games now, they're 3-9, they're and nine, I think it is, um, after the Tuesday night's loss into the Yankees. And then, you know, you mentioned you got one more against New York, then you're at Seattle and, and the Dodgers and Arizona to close out that stretch. So, yeah, I think there's concern that, you know, they haven't been playing that well and it's been coming against these teams that are, you know, fellow playoff contenders, postseason contenders, if not World Series contenders. So, yeah, I think big picture, I guess we all, in our minds, about a month, month and a half ago, we're looking, oh, they're on pace to win 110 games. I'm just going to be one of the greatest teams in baseball history. Obviously, it's a long season. That's not going to happen. Even the great teams, the very rare teams have won, you know, 110 plus games. Um, so, you know, it was bound to happen part of the deal, but, um, but no, I think this is troubling because it's kind of like, you know, they get a good outing from a, from a starter. They don't hit, they hit, they don't get a good outing from their starter or the bullpen uh, blows it. So they just really haven't been able to, to kind of put it all together. Um, and we'll see. I mean, I think the next week and a half will really determine because if they go out there and they keep losing series at Seattle, I mean, that easily could happen. They could stumble against the Marlins, Dodgers and Diamondbacks. And all of a sudden, Braves play well, it could be, you know, the, the lead could be down to, you know, a handful of games. Then I think it's really time to, you know, as August, mid-August rolls around, that could be uh that could be trouble. And just looking at the record too, it kind of 
scared me a little bit, right? All of a sudden, they're 65 and 42, and before you know it, you know, it could be very well before they get 70 wins, they get 50 losses. So the, I think going out west and having an off day on Thursday and travel day and all that fun stuff, especially a 12-30 game on Wednesday, um, maybe get out of there, get out of there quick, go spend a day out in Seattle on Thursday, get as far as way as from Philadelphia as possible and just kind of reset a little bit and maybe have your, your team meetings or whatever they end up doing. Right. And just kind of reset a little bit um, and hopefully move forward and take a good road trip out West and figure it out from there. Yeah. The rotation in the, that Mariner series is going to be Tyler Phillips game one, Colby Allard game two, which is just, I mean, nobody would have imagined that the Phillies late in the season would have two guys like that starting in a row, but uh, Ranger Suarez on the IL, Tylon Walker is still going to be out for about another two weeks, even if uh, these next couple of rehab starts go well. So, I mean, two of the last three wins, I think, were games started by Tyler Phillips, which is great yep. in the sense that he's given you depth that you needed and he's really producing. Um, I think that if you're like looking at it from an unbiased perspective, you do expect that at some point the worm's going to turn for Tyler Phillips. He's not going to keep, you know, pitching shutouts and getting so deep into games just based on like the minor league success and the league catching up to him more. Uh, but this Ranger Suarez situation is, I don't know. It's a little concerning, right? I mean, he's had back issues now uh, for about a month, a uh, different spot in his back right now. Rob Thompson said earlier this week, but he was also wor just pitching so much more than ever before. Like at the break, I think he was what, what like 40 innings more than he had thrown through that point a year ago. And he was on pace for 40, 50 more innings than that point. Um, and he was such a huge part of the Phillies' first two months, the fact that he was on that Cy Young pace. And when you don't have that, you know, that's one less day that you can count on getting excellence in the rotation. So all of a sudden that, which has been a strength most of the season, uh, you're starting to you're starting to see why starting pitching depth is important. Someone like Taiwan Walker would be great to have right now, you know, as, as much as he's been torn apart uh, the last year and a half. For sure. Yeah. And especially, I know we talked about this on the last podcast, but it, it seems like Rob Thompson wants to, to use a six man rotation just to get these guys a breather. Um, these guys, you know, being the NOLA, you know, wheelers and, and the guys that they're going to need in October. Uh, but that's easier said than done now when you're like, you just said you're relying on Colby Allard and Tyler Phillips, who's awesome. But yeah, he's at some point he's going to kind of come back to earth a little bit. So yeah, for sure. It's, it's tough. And the Ranger part of it, like, yeah, he's a, a huge part of what they did early this season, building out that big cushion, but he's also such a huge part of how they like to attack in October, um, you know, both as a starting pitcher and then they like to, to move him out in the bullpen and use him as a, a guy out of the pen, um, you know, in days where, you know, he would be throwing a bullpen. He, instead of that, let's use his, his 20 or 30 pitches out of the bullpen. So he's a big part of what they like to do, how they like to attack uh, late in games in the in the postseason when he's not starting and to have that option. So they need him healthy and effective. And, uh, and yeah, man, it, it's definitely troubling that he's dealing with this. And, and we thought he was good after the break. He comes out, pitches against Minnesota. Sounds good. He's good to go. And then, you know, onto the IL. So definitely troubling for me and uh, very interested to see if he is in fact back in Arizona, like they hope he is and how he comes out of it. What's, what's, what's Colby's leash here? Is it like one or two more starts and see what he does and then maybe give Banks a shot if Taiwan's not ready. And, you know, that's the thing. Then we, I feel like we've talked about it too. The, the Spencer Turnbull, I mean, eventually he's going to come back too. And hopefully, you know, it's when this offense starts clicking again and they're making this push and, then all of a sudden your pitching depth is not too shabby. But, I mean, Court, what do you think? Like, is Colby's – what's his leash here in terms of, you know, is it the Seattle start? And if he struggles there, are we maybe seeing Banks maybe get a start in or two before Taiwan returns? Well, Aller's going to make that start Saturday in Seattle, and the spot would come up one more time uh, until – the spot would come up again in the Arizona series. And then by the time the Phillies get back, they think they'll have either one or both of Walker and uh, Suarez – at that point. So you're looking at, at, you know, you're looking at probably two more starts out of that spot. Allard's going to get one. The second one could be him. If he pitches well, it could be an opener type situation like you just mentioned. Um, but you know, he, you know, I think what you saw out of Colby Allard over the weekend is what you can kind of expect that if he's located, he might be able to get soft contact with the things that can turn South in a hurry because he's throwing 89 miles per hour. And those guys just don't have wiggle room and he got hurt uh, pretty quickly. And that game changed. Uh, so, you know, they're just hoping to kind of get through four or five innings with him and then and then keep it rolling. But this is certainly not uh, 
the best that we've seen of the Phillies in 2024. They've come out of the all-star break. They haven't been able to put things together. Sean mentioned the, the blowing leads. That's something we really didn't see much in the year. Early on, they, they were scoring in the first couple innings every night, and they were holding on to those leads every night. And uh, it stood out because it was the success rate was through the roof, and now this is a little more normal. Um, but, you know, in my opinion, getting out of this Yankee series, just trying to salvage it with a win here. I know that some people might be listening to this series. It might be already over. Phillies might have gotten swept. They might have won that final game. But they just need to, like, get back to feeling good vibes. I know that these guys aren't going to freak out. They're not going to uh, try to do too much or say they're not going to try to do too much. Although I will say there have been a couple times last week or 10 days where it looks like Bryce Harper has been trying to hit a nine-run homer. Yep. Um, I know the guy swings hard to begin with, but – they just got to break out of this rut. It's a situation where, um, like, one big inning, one big night, one big comeback might be all they need to remember how they were feeling those first three months. See, and I, th- I thought that was going to happen on Saturday. I, you know, they had, what, four home runs, three home runs in the inning and against the um, – Whoever they were playing, the Guardians, the Guardians, and then Tyler yeah, Phillips yeah. a complete game shot. Yeah, yeah. Like, All right, that, here we go. I, yeah, I thought that was a turnaround. I thought that was like, here we go, here we go. And then what do they do? They come out Sunday, look flat, and then and then Monday get blown out. So, um, and then yeah, and then this one just a heartbreaker on on Tuesday night. So. I thought Austin Hayes' home run on Tuesday would be. Uh, they were they were, well, they were down one nothing. They tie it up. Then yep. he, they're up four one. It's like, All right, here we go. Let's win this game. Let's, let's win uh, with Sanchez in the series finale. Win a series, but. That seventh inning on Tuesday night was killer with Strom, just walking those guys, and then Jazz Chisholm. Jazz Chisholm has been unbelievable. He looks like he's locked in, and what a pickup what's, for the Yankees. Man. What's that stat you guys use? He's the first player in baseball history to have two multi-home run games in his first three games with a team, with a, with a franchise. Wow. He's played three games with the Yankees, um, one before the Philly series, now the first two games of the Philly series. And in the as we all know, the first two games of the Philly series, he's got two home runs in each game. <laughs> Four total, um, ton of RBIs. He's uh, he's locked in, man. That was a big home run he hit off of Matt Strom. Corey, you're talking about when Austin okay. Hayes hit that homer, the three run homer on Tuesday. I was just thinking, kind of similar to what you guys were just saying that okay, this is the deep breath. This is like the um, the deep breath that kind of like settles him in to Philadelphia as well. Right. Like, this is the the one bat they got at the deadline, and maybe he hit, maybe this is going to work out. Uh, and then obviously the game turned, but. It just shows you how difficult it is to be clicking on all cylinders the way they were with the offense starting pitching and then the bullpen protecting all those leads. Uh, but, you know, hopefully what we saw out of Austin Hayes on Tuesday was kind of just like a, a sign of more of what's to come because the Phillies didn't give him that leash to try to be an everyday player. Sorry, real quick, too. Um, as we wrap up, you were talking about bringing the vibes back. Do, do they bring the ultimate vibe back? I know it's been talked about on on uh, social media. You know, the ultimate vibe is quite right. I sure do, Spence. Time to move on. Oh my God. If, we're, if we're talking about dancing on my own, is that what we're talking about here? That's exactly what we're talking about. You know, my only thought that I'll present with dancing on my own is that there have been so many dozens of nights now over the last couple of years where I've just heard that yep. all night that I will leave the stadium. It'll be in my head all night. I'll wake up. It'll be in my head. It'll be in my head all day. I can't go back to that. We can't, <laughs> we can't go back in time. It's like in Lost with the – not wanting to go back to the island, like we just we can't go back to dancing on my own. I don't. It would be a sign of desperation right now. Too. It worked last year, didn't it? For a little bit, they they were struggling. They brought it back, no, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm I, I'm I'm with you guys. I'm with you. It's time once to, they get out west, we'll see. Maybe you know if it sparks a win, you know how baseball players are with the super yeah. team. So might yeah. only take that one win. But thanks a lot for staying late and joining us for this Phillies Talk podcast on trade deadline night. That's what the Phillies did. They got Austin Hayes, Carlos Estevez. And Tanner Banks, and time will tell whether it was enough for this team, which looks like it can win it all this year if uh, the chips fall in their favor in October. So thanks for listening. We'll catch you in a few days.